All right, welcome to this recorded version of a talk for the IROD user group 2021. This is uh, Marcus Kitzinger. He's with the IROD's consortium. He's our newest staff person and he's done amazing work. Take it away, Marcus. Hey there, uh, I'm Marcus. I've been working on IROD's since October. And uh, recently my focus has been on packaging and the build system. And for the past two or three months, I've been working on iCommands user space packaging. And iCommands user space packaging is uh, essentially we needed to package up the iCommands uh, in a way that it can be deployed in lockdown environments, uh, including all of the libraries that you need to run it. Um, and it needed to be packaged in such a way that you could just extract it and run it without any fuss. Um, and the reason why we needed this is because uh, we have, uh, we have users who uh, need to be able to deploy in lockdown environments where they can't install anything. Uh, it's pretty convenient uh, as well, just in general. So here's the goals and needs. Um, it needs to be as portable as possible. Uh, again, extract and run with, with little to no fuss. Um, all the dependencies built in, but we don't want to rebuild the universe. So we don't want to maintain our own build of open SSL or what have you. Uh, and we want, wanted as few extra build dependencies as possible to make these packages. Um, and just an overview of the solution, the, the approach that we took. Um, it's, it's, it's all Python 3, uh, driven by a CMake build target. Um, it produces uh, a tarball uh, specific to the target distribution. And uh, it's, it's for all the distributions that we currently support. Um, and then we have some minor surgery that we perform on the libraries and executables. And just to get into the details, um, the first thing that we do when uh, we run the packager, um, there's a whole bunch of information that's passed in from CMake, uh, stuff like build tool locations, uh, the names of, of different kinds of I commands, some dependency information, that kind of thing. Um, and then we also leverage the scripts that already exist in the IROD's repository. Um, several tools, like a, a bunch of build tools that um, might be used during the packaging. Uh, we search for those, uh, see if we can use them, and we make we prepare our workspace. Um, and then uh, we gather up the IROD's components. So we uh, use CMake to install the I commands into a temporary prefix. Um, and uh, there's two different kinds of I commands. There are shell scripts and there are executables. We don't need to do anything to the shell scripts. So we just go ahead and put them directly into the package bin directory. And uh, the binaries, we do need to do some surgery on. Uh, so we strip them and we clean them and then they're moved to a staging area. And then the same thing happens to a few of the IROD's plugins and the IROD's runtime libraries. And here's a little overview of the strip and clean process. Uh, there's a few tools that, that we leverage. If, uh, if none of them are available, then we skip this part. Uh, if only one of them is available, then we only do the first part. Um, so we strip out the unneeded symbols um, from the binary. And uh, then we determine if there are any uh, libraries that are imported that are not used. Um, and if there are, then we remove their entries from the binary's dynamic header. And this cuts down on the number of dependency libraries that are included in the final package, uh, which is a huge plus. Uh, the next thing we do is uh, we gather up our extra libraries. Now, there are two kinds of external dependencies. There's the, our, our externals, our IROD's externals, and then there are uh, distribution provided libraries. And we're going to help the packager figure out you know, which libraries it, it can include and which ones it must never include. We have uh, a set of directives uh, in, in files. Uh, we have a set of files for our uh, IROD's provided, and then we have a set of files for the distro provided. Um, and then it should a, uh, an external dependency be identified that is not in uh, one of these directives, uh, then the packager will scream about it and it will be excluded from the final package. Uh, we do have a flag that you can pass to, uh, to make it more permissive so that if, there, if, if you have a dependency that's not found in the directives, it will be included, but by default, they are excluded. Uh, so the next thing that, so uh, as, as part of this, um, 
we, uh, we do some stripping and cleaning. Uh, LDD, uh, we use that to get uh, the locations of all the dependency libraries. That's the whole dependency tree. Um, and then we go through uh, the direct dependencies of what we have staged. Um, we filter out what, uh, what's already staged and we, um, we filter against the directives. And then we use that, uh, the, the stuff from step one from LDD to get the locations of the direct dependencies. And then we strip them, clean them and stage them. And then we repeat that process until there's nothing left to stage. If uh, the Python module LAFE is not found or is not usable, then we take an alternate approach to this where we do it all at once uh, instead of going through it through the direct dependencies step by step um, because we can't eliminate uh, uh, extra dependencies um, without LAFE. And the next thing we do is uh, we set the uh, run path or R path. Um, and we do this so that we don't have to set an environment variable in order to run the I commands from the package. So for each stage binary, uh, we try to evaluate uh, what the uh, R path or run path should be. Um, and then we try and apply the R path or run path. And we have three different ways that we can do this, um, depending on what tools are available. Um, and uh, we have, uh, we will try each one until we get a success or until none of them work. If none of them work or if none of the tools are available, then the binary is used as is. And we do have a uh, priority queue. So uh, um, if, uh, let's say you're running on CentOS, then uh, we'll, one method will be uh, prioritized last, but otherwise it's usually prioritized first, that sort of thing. And uh, after we have set the R paths, and then we uh, create the final package. And uh, this is pretty straightforward. It's just tarring it up. Uh, we do pass a few um, extra flags to the tar tool to make sure that uh, you know it's suitable for a package. Like we don't have weird ownership or permissions on the files, that sort of thing. Uh, some other fun details about the packager. Uh, it's multi-threaded. Uh, so we do take advantage of multi-core processors. Um, and it's handy. So we've got a couple of uh, modules in there that are used um, as uh, modules, but they're also executables in their own right. If you run them, uh, you can do your own surgery manually if you need to. Um, there are a couple of other solutions that we considered. Uh, we looked at Conda and we looked at building in a container against Alpine Linux or Ubuntu Trusty. Um, and we decided against that uh, for a couple of reasons, but the main thing being, uh, if we did it this way, we would have to uh, essentially rebuild a whole bunch of different packages, especially with Conda, and we did not want that responsibility. Um, so we opted against that and went with the solution instead. Uh, so here's some of the challenges that we ran into. Uh, LAFE is a Python module that we use to uh, do a lot of the surgery. Um, and it's, it's very handy. It does nearly everything that we want it to do, but, uh, and, and it doesn't, it doesn't also doesn't come with, uh, you know, a lot of extra baggage. You don't need to compile it. It's very easy to get your hands on, uh, no extra dependencies. It's just all right there, ready to go. Um, it's in pip, you can just download it. And, uh, but the thing is it's, it's very crashy and it has a tendency to mangle up binaries when it's done working with them. Uh, so we, we've, we've had to, um, like it's it's in some cases it's used as a fallback. Um, we just try to uh, avoid using it uh, unless we have to, and there are some cases where we do have to. Um, and then, uh, like one of the one of the areas where it, it's particularly troublesome is with the our, uh, run path and R path setting. Um, we would run into seg faults all the time before we uh, changed uh, the priority of the different methods that we were using. Uh, so speaking of our path and run path, uh, we use the substitution string dollar sign origin uh, in our run paths and our paths. And when you do that, you're supposed to set the DF origin flag um, and so that the uh, runtime linker doesn't get angry at you. Um, and, but in order to do that, we have to use leaf. Um, and again, like that's, that's a bit problematic, uh, but it turns out uh, that nobody actually follows that part of the specification properly. Um, and when I learned, learned about that, I nearly had a heart attack, but it turns out that works in our benefit. 
Um, so as long as uh, the IRADS runtime and the I commands themselves have the DF origin flag set, then we're golden. And we can actually have that origin flag set as part of the build process before the packager is, even comes into the picture. Uh, so that makes it super easy. We do still set the DF origin flag if we can and when we can, um, but uh, it's not really important uh, it, because we can set it during the build step. Um, so there, we also had some issues with our external dependencies. Um, so anything that we're passing in through CMake instead of uh, you know finding with uh, uh, by inspecting the binaries directly, um, we um, it's usually being passed in as a, a development library uh, symlink, or if it might not even be a symlink, it might be a, a linker script file. Um, now this is uh, a bit problematic uh, because we we want the so names. So what we have to do is we have to like go through the symlinks and figure out like where the actual file is and and where's the so name and and that sort of thing. Um, and we've we've managed to, to work around that. Uh, the only uh, in the final package, the only symlinks that we care about uh, is a symlink from the so name to the actual file name. Um, and if the file name is a so name, then we just don't have a symlink. Um, for Linker script files, we only ran into that in one case, and we have a special uh, a, a special if else for that case um, in the code, so that we we handle it separately. Um, but if we were to run into, run into it more, we probably would have to implement a parser for length script files. But thankfully, we didn't have to do that. Um, when we were looking at uh, trying to make more portable packages to uh, so that you could have one package that would work on pretty much any distribution, uh, we ran into, um, uh, we, we found out that uh, OpenSSL, the OpenSSL libraries have different so names on CentOS and Ubuntu, uh, which would have thrown a wrench in that. Um, fortunately, we didn't have to really worry about that since OpenSSL is installed by default on CentOS and we weren't going to be doing uh, a, a package portability quite to that extent. Um, now another wrench that, that would have been, uh, another um, thing that would have been an issue uh, with package portability would have been uh, simple versioning in glibc. Um, every Linux distribution has its uh, libc that it uses. And for CentOS and Ubuntu, that's glibc. And glibc uses symbol versioning, which means that if you build against, say, version 2.18 of glibc, you can't run that uh, binary or, or library against glibc 2.17. There are ways to remove the symbol versions from your library or executable, but it, it's just, it's, it's a huge pain and we didn't want to deal with it. Um, moreover, you can't actually bundle glibc in the package because it makes the runtime linker very, very angry. Um, when it comes to knowing what to bundle and what not to bundle when you're going through the dependencies, uh, there's not really any way to uh, figure out at package time uh, what libraries are installed out of the box on a given Linux distribution, which is why we had to create those, uh, those directive files. Um, one of the things that I spent a good amount of time thinking about as well was uh, how to how we were going to invoke the packager, how we were going to get all of the information uh, that we needed at package time uh, available uh, to the packager without the user having to you know, keep track of all of these different things. Uh, we The easiest thing to do is uh, CMake uh, build target. So that's what we did. Um, and we also, uh, for 4, 429, we uh, introduced the ability to change the, uh, the directories uh, where things are stored uh, when IRODS is installed. Um, and you do that at configure time uh, when you run CMake. Um, and that also comes into play uh, with relocatable packages, which is essentially what a user space package is. Um, and because, uh, one of the, because we were making um, assumptions about where everything is going to be initially, uh, they were bad assumptions because uh, before we introduced that functionality to the build system, uh, everything had uh, hard coded paths for uh, say var, lib, irods for the home directory and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so I had to submit a pull request 
to the, um, the IRODs repository proper to, um, to fix these bad path assumptions. It's pretty simple, but it, it took me a bit to track down where exactly that those assumptions were being made. And then I think the biggest hurdle um, was Python 3.5. So when I wrote this packager, I was initially targeting Python 3.9 with backwards compatibility shims all the way down to Python 3.6. That was pretty straightforward, not too difficult. Um, but for the stable branch for 4.2.9, we had to implement support for Python 3.5. And between Python 3.5 and 3.6 is when Python 3 started to really get good. Um, there, there were some tactical changes uh, and, and stuff like that. And not only that, but the version of Python 3.5 that is in the repositories for Ubuntu Xenial has a bug in the standard library, an infinite recursion bug that, that I had to work around. And you can see my ugly, awful workaround. Uh, let's see. Uh, in the compact shims module that I've written. And if you want to lose some sleep at night, uh, you can stare at this for a little while. Uh, so and that was a, a, a huge pain to deal with, but uh, we did we did manage to get it working for the stable branch on Ubuntu Zeno. All right, so we do have some to-dos, uh, some nice to haves, uh, some things left over. Uh, we want to decrease our reliability on LAFE, maybe even find an alternative. Um, and we want to prevent LAFE's seg faults from crashing the whole packager. Because right now, if it, if it does run into a problem in the native code, it does just bring down the whole thing. Um, we want to be able to figure, we want to be able to clean out unused library imports with symbol version references. Um, we want to, um, we've got a whole bunch of code in the packager that's, uh, that can be moved over to the IROD scripts folder and leverage uh, in more places. So that's one thing, that, that's another thing we want to do. Uh, we want to implement, uh, uh, we want to be able to use Objump as an alternative to ReadElf, depending on you know, what's available on the system at package time. Uh, and right now on CentOS, uh, setting the run path or R path with CMake is currently broken. So we need to fix that. Uh, we also want to want to be able to use Radel for Objump to make stripping and uh, the run path setting smarter. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that we might also run into in the future, if we ever start building against Alpine, um, is mu Muzzle's LDD. Um, Muzzle is a, another implementation of libc, but their LDD uh, it, it works a little bit differently to glibc's, um, and it, it doesn't support the um, the, the flags that we passed to LDD to identify unused libraries. So we'd have to figure that out. Um, we all, I also want to make the library directive syntax rolling release friendly so we can build against Alpine if we want to. And uh, we might also need to implement Linker script file handling in the future. Uh, so here is the packager itself and all of its glory, all of the individual files. Um, we, here's, here's the, uh, directive files here. Um, and then, uh, here's an example of how you might run the packager. Um, so it's, uh, it is just a, um, a, a CBake, uh, target here, user space fireball. Um, but, uh, what I like to do when I'm building is I like to make sure that the origin flag is set in IRODs itself. So I do build IRODs. Um, this is essentially the script that I use myself when I'm building, so you, you can see exactly what I do. Uh, and uh, here's what uh, the externs, the IRODs provided um, uh, library directives look like. Um, it's just the names, and then for the distribution provided, we, we have the full so names, and then we have a little mark indicating, you know, whether or not uh, the libraries uh, can be excluded or must be excluded. And that's, that's the, uh, that's the packager. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I think that's uh, right at 20 minutes and uh, we'll try to answer all these really smart questions that the audience will have that you will not be able to hear unless you join us. That's thanks, right. uh, thanks a lot, Marcus and great job. Uh, welcome to the team and, uh, We'll see you when you get back. Thank you. All right, so we did it. I played a video on the internet. Good job. Marcus, can you hear us?
Yes, I can. All right, let's see if we've got any questions. Uh, we do have a uh, Marius Kortoff at uh, Surf. He says, thank you, Marcus. Uh, the package manager allowed us at Surf to compile the I commands for CentOS 8. So I wanted to hear that. That is, a, that is a success. That's a checkbox. I know that you also built what, what did what did you build also for people? You built something for was it for Cyber? Yes. Uh, I can't remember who it was for, but we did have um, some folks wanted some user space packages for four point two point eight, and I was able to get those out for CentOS seven and for Ubuntu Bionic. That's right. That's right. And that was uh, yes, that was right before we released four two nine. So uh, very good. Uh, great to see Alpine in play from Keith James. How likely is it to become a thing, he says. <laughs> so one of the things that um, I have been slowly working towards in my work on the build system in general um, is being able to build against the system packages, um, you know, regardless of you know, what version of Boost you have installed or, or, or what version of LLVM that you're using. Um, and uh, I would like to be able to, uh, you know, have people be able to just have, build this really, really easily on whatever distribution they happen to be running, including Alpine. And um, Alpine is something in particular that I, I would like to see because it uses the uh, muzzle libc, which doesn't use simple versioning and is compatible with glibc. Which would make uh, you know it would it would help us make even more portable user space packages. That's right. Yeah, I know that the we haven't had to bump a minimum version of you know the stuff that we need for a, for a while now for Boost and for the you know the actual compiler and CMake and stuff like that. So uh, obviously for for distributions that are old enough that they don't have native installations that are new enough of the packages, we still need to do something, but. If we could intelligently do a version check on a minimum, um, that would ease our load a lot. Right now we have a sledgehammer. You build all the things for all the platforms because that's what we had time to do. But if we can be more selective and surgical about that, I, I agree that would be spectacular. And then things that live in the future, like you know, Arch and Alpha, whatever, then you know, basically we have to build nothing. That would be that would be amazing. Uh, let's see. Oh, so Tony, Tony did does thank you for the so the 428 packages were for Cyverse uh, out in Arizona. And that's good. Uh, Alan says, do you know all the platforms this has been tested on or just the ones that you tried? Do you have a list? So I have tested this myself on CentOS 7, uh, Ubuntu Xenial, and Ubuntu Bionic for um, master and for stable. Um, I didn't test every single I command that came out of the packages, but I was able to get, I, I did test INET and ILS for all of them. And then for, um, I think it was Bionic, uh, I tested a few, a few of the other ones. I think I admin and I meta, um, and I put, I tested those. So yeah, like the, the package, like the, it does generate a, a good package for, um, everything, but I haven't tested every single I command to make right. sure that they all, all individually work. Right, so yes, if, uh, if you in the community are interested in poking at this, please try it. It shouldn't be such a, a, a hard lift because of Marcus's work. So it sounds like we have Ubuntu 16, 18, CentOS 7, and now we've confirmed CentOS 8 from Surf. Uh, I don't think anybody's tried it on Ubuntu 20 yet. Um, and then obviously we've had a few people try with, uh, with Arch and Debian and things like that with, with varieties of success and failure. Uh, we don't on. have library directives, uh, library directive files for CentOS 8 or uh, Ubuntu 20. Um, but once we have, you know, an actual IRODS builds for those uh, systems, it shouldn't be hard to figure out what uh, needs to go in those files. Interesting. Okay, so I'm wondering what uh, Marius did at Surf for CentOS 8, so maybe he can he can share. And then Tony confirms it works for Ubuntu 20 as well, so. Um, yeah, I think the uh, the package that, that I build for um, Ubuntu 18 works on 2004 as well, uh, because there weren't any, any major uh, changes in the libraries that are installed by default. That's right, I think that's, I think that's a true statement. <laughs> This is all couched in uh, speculation because we don't have it all in CI yet. So we're, 
we're, we're waving our arms around greenish dots that don't exist. So yes, thank you so much. Uh, again, great, great job. And uh, this is, there, there's quite a bit of to do left to do. And uh, I think we'll knock it out pretty quick.